just start up by giving a couple of uh, technical notes. Um, uh, first of all, if you can hear me, um, would you mind just typing into your chat functions, which is usually located on the right side of your screen, um, that you can hear me. Just type in yes or good or whatever, um, just to make sure that the sound is working. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. If you can't hear me, um, uh, hopefully it will it will resolve itself. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, uh, my name is Sarah Medeiros, and I'm the Communications and External Affairs Assistant here at the National Women's Law Center. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, if you care about protecting people from sexual harassment, you should care about reproductive justice. Um, uh, all attendee lines will be on mute during today's webinar. Uh, we will be taking questions after our experts are finished with the main presentation, and we encourage you to submit questions throughout the webinar um, using the chat function that you just did now. Um, you can submit a question um, at any time, um, and like I said before, the dashboard through which you submit questions is usually found on the right side of your screen. Um, this webinar will have live captioning throughout, which you should be able to see now um, at the top of your screen, at the top of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and lastly, the webinar will be recorded. And as a registrant and attendee, you'll receive links to the recording of the presentation as well as the slides within the next few days. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to Kelly Garcia, the Director of Reproductive Justice Initiatives and Senior Counsel at the National Women's Law Center. Great. Thank you so much and welcome to everyone who has taken time out to join us today for this webinar. Um, today, I'm going to start out by giving just a little bit of overview of the webinar um, series and um, the National Women's Law Center before we turn it over to our wonderful speakers. Jess Morales Riquetto from the National Domestic Workers Alliance, and Jennifer Mondino from the National Women's Law Center and the Times of Legal Defense Fund. So, before we get started, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the National Women's Law Center. We uh, are passionate champions of policies and laws that help women and girls achieve their potential throughout their lives at school, at work, at home, and in their communities. We're committed advocates who take on the toughest challenges, especially for the most vulnerable women, and we've really been working to make change happen. And so we are proud to have been on the front lines of advances for women for more than 40 years, um, working to benefit women, their families, and their communities. We um, have been, I'm also proud that I have been um, part of this webinar series for about the past six years, and together with if, when, how, we have been doing the webinar for about 10 years. Um, and with that the kind of quick introduction, I want to turn it over to Cami. Um, turn it over to Cami Dodson so she can tell you a little bit more about If, When, How. Thanks, Kelly. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. So my name is Cami Dodson. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator at the National Office of If, When, How, Lawyering for Reproductive Justice. This is the first webinar in If, When, How and the National Women Law Center's ninth annual series. We're very excited to have had the opportunity to work together again, and we're very glad that you've all joined us today, and hopefully you'll join us for the rest of the series. In case this is the first time you're tuning into this webinar series, or if you're not familiar with If, When, How, we are a national nonprofit that trains, networks, and mobilizes law students and legal professionals to work within and beyond the legal system to champion reproductive justice. We work with chapters on law school campuses across the country, our incredible reproductive justice federal fellows currently working in Washington, D.C., state fellows in Seattle and Pittsburgh, and HIV fellows in Atlanta and Oakland, and a growing community of legal professionals across the country. And now, starting in fall 2019, we'll be working with reproductive justice fellows placed at organizations in the South to support the RJ movement and powerful advocates leading grassroots efforts to realize reproductive justice in their states and the region. If when how believes that achieving reproductive justice will take thoughtful action and strategic activism, acknowledging the intersection of identities, collaborating across disciplines, and working toward a critical transformation of the legal system because ensuring that all people have the right to decide if, when, and how to create families depends entirely on if, when, and how hard we fight. When this webinar series was started nine years ago, 
Um, our organizations wanted to highlight the many ways reproductive justice intersects with other important social justice issues. Certainly today's topic, which I know has been weighing heavily on many of us this week in particular, is deeply intertwined with reproductive justice, racial justice, gender justice, and so many other important issues. We're very excited to hear from today's speakers and learn more about the work that they are doing um, to combat sexual harassment. So on behalf of If When How, I want to give a big thanks to the National Women's Law Center, particularly Kelly, Mikkel, and Sarah, as well as our esteemed presenters for bringing their expertise to this webinar. Thank you all for joining us and for your interest in reproductive justice. And I think I will turn it back to Kelly. Right. Thank you, Cami, and thank you to all of you at Ithlin Howe who have helped really pull together what I think is going to be a wonderful webinar series um, this, yeah, a wonderful webinar series this year. So we our upcoming webinars are going to be on Wednesday, October 17th. If you care about stopping school push out, you should care about reproductive justice. I'm just gonna give a little shout out to that. We are hoping to have um, some young women who have been at the forefront of really changing dress code policies at their schools and so we're really excited for um for that webinar and what um and hope you can join us to hear about that and we have another topical webinar sorry and i just see that there's a typo we have another topical webinar coming up on wednesday november 14th and um, if you care about immigrant justice, you should really care about reproductive justice. And that's another, if you've been paying attention to the news, you'll know that immigration is also another place where we have been seeing just so many attacks on, on our immigrant communities. And we wanna make sure that um, you're able to join that webinar and hear more about how the intersections there between immigrant justice and reproductive justice. And so before I turn it over to our great speakers, I want to, um, take just a moment to talk about what is reproductive justice and how is it we came to be doing these webinars. So the reproductive justice movement is a response to the fact that women of color, low-income women, and younger women are as likely, if not more likely, to face resistance to their childbearing and child rearing as they are to have trouble accessing contraception and abortion. So RJ recognizes that multiple forms of social oppression and discrimination keep individuals from being able to have and raise healthy families. And so full reproductive freedom, therefore, requires addressing all forms of inequality. So the right of individuals to have the children they want, care for the children they have, and their, plan their families through safe legal access to abortion and contraception is core to the reproductive justice framework and lens. Reproductive justice requires that all people have the resources as well as the economic, social, and political power to make decisions about their bodies, sexuality, and reproduction with determination and dignity, with self-determination and dignity. So sexual harassment and assault are direct attacks on a person's autonomy, bodily integrity, and dignity. And the repercussions of sexual harassment and assault at work can be far-reaching, putting women in the untenable position of having to risk their jobs and their ability to care for themselves and their families, or to continue to remain in a workplace where they are subjected to continued harassment and even assault. So as hard as these conversations may be, and as hard as it may be um, to be talking about this right now, I'm actually, I'm really glad that we are having this webinar today um, before tomorrow's hearings. It's incredibly important for all of us right now to stand up and say that we won't be silenced. And that's really the core of what we want to be talking about today. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our first speaker, Jess morales Riquetto um, from the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Hi everyone, I was just getting a little unmuted there, sorry about that. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me on this webinar. It's really exciting to be talking to all of you and especially in this moment, there really uh, isn't a better time to be talking uh, about the work that we're doing and about what we need to do to really combat the attacks um, that all of us are facing. Um, so I wanna tell you a little bit more about me and about the domestic workers. Um, I'm not, I don't know who is controlling the slides, but if you are, it would be good to move me on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so 
The National Domestic Workers Alliance represents 2.5 million workers all around the country. Domestic workers are nannies, house cleaners, and caregivers for the elderly and attendants for people with disabilities. They provide the work that makes all of other work possible. Um, we are an extremely large and growing workforce, which I think is really important for everyone to know. By 2030, which really isn't that far away, care jobs, which includes child care and elder care, will represent the largest occupation in our nation's workforce. In fact, home-based elder care is already the single fastest growing occupation in our entire economy due to the rapidly growing aging population. Domestic workers free up the time and attention of millions of working families by caring for our children, our aging parents, our loved ones living with disabilities in our homes. Some live in the homes of their employers, while others have many clients that they work for. Most domestic workers are women, and disproportionately immigrants and women of color. Over 90% of domestic workers um, are women. A majority of them are immigrant, black, and women of color. They work in urban and rural areas and are employed by all kinds of people and families. But they often make low wages and work in isolation. Next slide, please. Because of that, they are extremely likely to experience uh, sexual harassment. Uh, the intimacy of care work creates really unique vulnerabilities to abuse. Um, it's it, partly because it takes place behind closed doors and is really personal and intimate. Um, it's work that's often very hidden. Workplaces are totally unregistered and mostly unregulated. Women work alone and all of these dynamics really create a wild west type of environment. Um, which means that it increases the vulnerability of the workers to abuse and the likelihood that unscrupulous employers will get away with abusive behavior. Um, domestic workers really cannot count on the law to protect them against sexual violence. We're joined by our sisters in the farm workers um, having faced a long history of exclusion from basic labor protections rooted in the legacy of slavery in America. Domestic workers have specifically been excluded from federal labor protections like minimum wage and the right to organize a union. Anti-discrimination laws and harassment laws usually exclude domestic workers by default because of the non-traditional nature of our workforce. We're really proud at the National Domestic Workers Alliance and because of the organizing of our incredible domestic workers, eight states have now passed Domestic Worker Bill of Rights to fix lots of these loopholes including and especially establishing sexual harassment and human rights protections at the state level. But we have a lot more work to be done because even with legal protections, domestic workers still face barriers to stopping sexual harassment in their workplaces and enforcing their rights. Many domestic workers are not aware of their rights um, and lots of employers don't see their homes as workplaces. They, you know, they'll call the nanny the babysitter or they'll say things like, you know, our, our domestic worker is part of our family. We treat her like she's part of our family. Um, and so they don't always see that relationship as an employee-employer relationship that deserves, um, you know, employee-employer protections. Um, not only that, but the process for a domestic workers to file a complaint against sexual harassment is really um, a barrier. Most domestic workers can't afford a lawyer and it can be difficult to navigate the administrative process or figure out which agency to go to. Um, and not the least of which is, you know, many times when you um, have a complaint against, um, uh, you know, in the workplace, you give that complaint to your employer. In the case of sexual harassment, what often happens to domestic workers is they are um, being, uh, victimized by the employers themselves. And so literally, who do they go to um, when that happens? Um, you know, and not only that, there, there are real risks for domestic workers in uh, communicating about um, an, a sexual harassment incident, including threats, but possibly more abuse, um, them potentially being torn from their family um, or children by deportation for undocumented domestic workers, maybe being fired from a job that pays their bills and supports their family. They may lose their housing if they live in the home of their employer, um, or they might not get a reference letter, which is a huge problem for a domestic worker. Without a reference letter, a blacklist like that would make it really hard for them to find employment. Um, slide. So, thank you. So that's why we're really focused on solutions. Um, more than ever, we have the opportunity to fundamentally change our culture and our policies and make sexual harassment and abuse unacceptable once and for all. 
we believe it's critical for survivors to lead the way. And once they do, we think that we can really rewrite the rules that devalue the lives of women in low wage jobs. Um, and one of the first ways we need to do that is by promoting safe and dignified working environments. We need to close those loopholes in state and local laws so that workplace harassment and abuse is illegal in every single workplace, no exceptions. And when we say that, I think people get a little bit um, taken aback that that's uh, that actually is the case, but we really are starting from the bottom here. Um, it would be a major victory to say that harassment and abuse is illegal in every workplace. Um, and, but we also want to continue, of course, to advocate for employment agreements that spell out a worker's rights and protections. Um, many of our workers are not on contracts, and that makes it even harder for them um, to prove their working relationship and then, of course, to get the protections they deserve. We also need to end workplace sexual violence, make it simple and safe for domestic workers to report abuse and file complaints, and ensure that those who are in charge with enforcement, which is a major issue for us, um, people who are supposed to enforce anti-discrimination and har harassment laws, need to be trained to really properly handle the unique nature of domestic worker cases and use investigation techniques that really minimize the potential for retaliation. Um, and, it's really critical that we have the funding to do that so that domestic workers are able to represent themselves, I'm, I'm sorry, are able to have appropriate legal representation, um, be able to have advocacy that supports them and get know your rights trainings and social and housing services that um, mitigate barriers that prevent them from reporting because of their fear of retaliation. And really the only way to do that is to change the culture that makes abuse possible. Change really does start at home and with all of us. So if you have a domestic worker, you can be an agent for change immediately. You can talk to the domestic worker in your life and ask her if she feels safe and respected. And you know, this part's hard, especially if, you know, like men, you see a domestic worker as part of your family. If your domestic worker um, indicates to you that she does not feel safe and respected, it's really important that you listen to her and believe her about the experiences that she's had. Um, and you have the power to really empower her. If you employ a domestic worker, let her know her rights. Make sure that she knows um, your home is a workplace and that you're treating domestic work um, with dignity and respect and her with dignity and respect. Next slide, please. Now, how does all of this kind of go with reproductive justice? You know, I just came off going on a two week cross country whirlwind tour all around um, a, to really talk about the Supreme Court nomination and, and reproductive rights and how critical it is for us to really take action on that. Um, and for us, it's because we know it's incredibly important to empower women of color. Prior to Roe, um, the women who were dying from abortions were Black and Latino women. Um, and so it's really critical to us that we don't go back to that. Um, one of the things that we said all over the country about um, the Supreme Court nomination of Brett Kavanaugh is that he's a threat to our bodies, our health, and our rights. You know, we've been holding rallies and visiting centers in, in key areas um, for months now, and I know many of you have been part of that. And so I just want to say thank you so much for this work. You know, um, when we first started doing this, people said that there was no way that we could, you know, make enough noise, put enough pressure on to stop a Supreme Court nomination. And you know, whatever happens, we have seismically changed the debate about this. And, um, and that's because of the work that many of you have done. So I just really do want to just say my heartfelt thanks. It's not done yet, so make sure to call your senator if you haven't um, yet. You know, and I think that for us, why this really resonated with us is that just like what's happening to the women who are accusing Kavanaugh of sexual assault, many times domestic workers um, are not listened to. And when we believe survivors, when we center survivors, and we really stand up in solidarity with their stories, that is how we are able to grow this movement and still stay here. You know, the stakes are the highest that they've ever been. We have to do everything that we can to block cabinet from being appointed to the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, this is like an SOS moment and we're really saving ourselves in this process. And we know that women have really been at the forefront of all of the resistance activity you know, before Trump got elected in after. Um, and this, I've been telling everybody, like, this one's for all the marbles, whatever you care about. But in particular, if you care about reproductive justice, you know, this, this nomination has to be stopped. One thing that for us, you know, we've been really watching closely is um, uh, Kavanaugh's vote on the Jane Doe case, which involved a um, undocumented woman in detention, uh, a young woman in detention, who went through very extraordinary measures to ensure that she 
um, could get an abortion and his own extraordinary measures to make sure that didn't happen. And for us, it's really all we need to know about um, his stance on, on, on Roe v. Wade. Next slide, please. So what are we hoping to accomplish? Do we think that our efforts will stop his nomination and make him withdraw? I mean, absolutely, yes. I really feel unequivocally, I just like, I believe deeply that not only have we changed the conversation on this, we have done, you know, and we'll continue to keep doing everything we can to stop this nomination, and I see that insight. Um, the latest allegation should be the nail in the coffin for Kavanaugh's nomination. You know, this confirmation process has been flawed from the start and should have stopped a long time ago. It's been rushed and hushed and never should have even started until Kavanaugh's full record was released. Um, and so, you know, it, and then once the hearing started and he misled the Senate, lied under oath during those hearings, uh, it should have been stopped then. So now more than ever, it really needs to be halted immediately. Um, and that's why we, um, you know, started the Dear Professor Ford campaign with our collaborators, um, Bella Mendoza and Sarah Sophie Plicker. Um, we wanted to really send a clear message to Dr. Christine Blasey Ford and and now also to Deborah Ramirez that we believe them and we will stand by them and that their courage is contagious. As I said before, a core of what we believe at NDWA about sexual harassment is that survivors are stronger when we are at the center of our own story and when we stand up together. And I think that's what we've seen, just an incredible outpouring of support for both Dr. Ford and um, Deborah Ramirez and for any other survivors that we know are going to be coming. Um, we're also really trying to send a crystal clear message to Brett Kavanaugh. Enough is enough. He has the obligation and frankly, like needs to exercise like moral decency and withdraw his nomination. He is not fit to sit on the Supreme Court or on any court. Um, we really know what happens um, to survivors and, and how they are forced to relive this trauma again. And that's why we can't ignore what's happening and need to stand up. Um, and so we are really want to urge folks call your senators make sure that you're taking action on this um, it's so 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 important and for us the domestic workers we know that um, the most marginalized uh, are often the most forgotten and so if we can't stop this complete train wreck it's going to be really difficult for us to uh, get the kind of attention that we need for the most marginalized lives in our communities. And we know that low-income women will be the most affected by what happens around reproductive justice and the decisions that will be made on the Supreme Court around reproductive justice. So doing everything that we can to stop this, and I hope that you'll join us. And now handing back over um, to you all. Kelly, any back to you or Sarah or Cami? Sorry, folks, I think we're having a bit of technical difficulties. One second. Well, Jennifer, if you're on the line, um, hopefully we can hear from you. We're going to go ahead and turn it over to Jennifer Mondino, Senior Counsel for the Times Up Legal Defense Fund uh, at the National Women's Law Center Fund. Are you on, Jennifer? Hello, can you hear us now? Yes, now we can. All right, sorry about that. There was a little bit of a microphone snafu here um, and we had to redial uh, back in. So many apologies for the dead air, everyone. Um, but now we are gonna turn this over to Jennifer Mondino, uh, the Senior Counsel for the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund at the National Women's Law Center. 
Hi, everyone. Sorry for the technical glitch. I was starting to say just thank you for inviting me to be a part of this presentation and having the opportunity to tell you all a little bit about the fantastic work that we are doing at the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. Personally, I was really intrigued to be invited to speak on how the work that we're doing at the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund factors into the reproductive justice movement. I am pretty new to the National Women's Law Center and to the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, but have been working on issues of women's rights and the rights of domestic violence victims and sexual assault victims and working in reproductive rights for my whole legal career. So to me, it really makes sense to be talking about these things together. And you know, part of the reason that I think it makes so much sense to be talking about these things together is because those are all different issues that kind of affect the same set of folks. You know, like I, I have worked in organizations serving domestic violence victims. I have worked at a reproductive rights organization. Now I'm here at the National Women's Law Center working with the Times Up Legal Defense Fund. And the stories that we hear um, are so often the same stories. We're just looking at them from sort of different lenses. And they're so complementary. So I am, you know, happy that there are uh, folks that are framing it that way. And, and I'm glad that you all are on the line um, thinking about how these issues come together, because they, they really, really do. Anyway, I will introduce you all a bit to the work here at the Times Up Legal Defense Fund. So the way that it's set up is the Times Up Legal Defense Fund and the Legal Network for Gender Equity are both part of the National Women's Law Center Fund. And the National Women's Law Center Fund is housed at and administered by the National Women's Law Center. So the Times Up Legal Defense Fund and the Legal Network for Gender Equity are, are two separate but very related things um, that have come out of the Me Too movement and the Time's Up organization. And I'll tell you a little bit about what each of those things does. So the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund is intended to provide funding to help defray the costs of providing legal assistance and also media and storytelling assistance to attorneys who are representing individuals who have experienced sexual harassment, assault, abuse, and related retaliation in the workplace. And we have raised uh, already upwards of $20 million, which is really exciting. There are some really famous and high profile folks who have gotten behind the Time's Up and the Me Too movement and helped us do a lot of fundraising. So it is a, a very exciting situation to be in the position of having money to give out to folks that want to bring these kinds of cases. Um, so the way that it works is attorneys will bring their applications to the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund and explain to us why it is that they um, that they need the assistance and what kinds of cases they're they want to bring, and we here will review those applications to determine who we're going to um, award funds to. Um, a lot of times, you know, there are different reasons that that it might be difficult for an attorney to be able to bring a case like this. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's because they are going to be going against a, a really powerful or a high profile person um, and it's going to be a long, hard fight or they are challenging the law um, and they, you know, need assistance to be able to make that uh, sort of a, 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 real, a financially realistic case to bring. Um, another situation might be that you have uh, a domestic worker or somebody in a very small organization, um, or a farm worker, somebody who is working at um, working for very low wages or working for a type of employer that is going to make it really difficult for the attorney to have the possibility of getting um, you know, attorney fees or costs or damages at the end of that lawsuit. So they want to be able to bring this case, um, but there's not a chance of getting the kind of financial reward that they might have from another case. So they come to us and ask us for 
for assistance with that. Um, the other side of this, that you, know, you can see on this little chart, is the Legal Network for Gender Equity. So what that is, is we have gotten together a network of attorneys that's now at more than 800 attorneys across the country. And these are attorneys who have agreed to do a free initial consultation with individuals who have brought their stories to us. And so these are attorneys who are experienced in litigation, experienced in employment law. Um, and the way that it works is we have individuals bringing their, their stories to us and we um, review their stories and match them with three attorneys in, in the legal network. So we will send them the names of, of three attorneys who have volunteered to do this, this consultation. And then it's on the folks who have contacted us to get in touch with those attorneys, um, have that initial consultation, and then decide if they want to go forward working with um, that person as their attorney, and maybe um, later going forward and, and thinking about doing media and storytelling assistance too. Sometimes what will happen, and you know this is happening frequently, and it's, it's a nice way that the two parts of um, the work that we're doing here kind of complement one another, is uh, an attorney who has met somebody that was referred to them will then come to us and apply for funding from the Times Up Legal Defense Fund, um, and and so that it kind of brings it brings it full circle. Um, can we move to the next slide? So um, it's a pretty new project, um, but since January 1st, we have responded to more than 3,500 intakes, and I mean stories that people have brought to us about workplace sexual harassment and assault. And as I said, we have recruited here, it says 700, but it's actually more than 800 attorneys across the country who have agreed to take on these cases. Um, what kinds of people are reaching out to us? This is something that we are paying a lot of attention to here. We have you know, set priority areas for the, the kinds of cases that we really want to fund. Um, and you know, those are uh, public. One of, the, you know, one of the things is low wage workers, but we really um, stress to folks that are bringing their applications to us that we are looking for cases that bring out intersectionality issues. And we want them to explain to us in their applications um, how that might be happening. So we're, you know, keeping close tabs on what the what the demographic information of the folks that we're serving is. Um, so far, um, we have uh, nearly 70% of the the people that we're we're serving with this identifying as low wage workers, and 10% um, of folks who are identifying as LGBTQ. Um, you can see from this that we also have. Uh, a, a pretty substantial portion of proportion of the folks who are identifying as people of color. So, interesting things to note about it. Um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, I just want to make a quick. Um, sorry, this is Sarah again. I just want to apologize. There seems to be some uh, data that is not quite showing up for whatever reason on the PowerPoint. So my apologies. Um, so uh, oh, the blue I category. Um, the blue category here that I'm circling uh, should say Asian, um, this one should say Black non-Hispanic, um, and this one should say Hispanic. So uh, apologies about that, I'm not sure um, why that's happening. Just wanted to, to clarify that um, before you. we moved on. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay, um, so this chart is showing what, what industries um, we are looking at. So one of the priority areas that we have, we have set out for cases coming to us, to the Times Up Legal Defense Fund, are industries where there is uh, a, a, a low proportion of women working in those industries. So, you know, things like construction, um, law enforcement, firefighters, this sort of thing. Um, we're also interested in in industries with low wage workers, or where it's especially difficult for people to get access to counsel or to speak out about sexual harassment and sexual abuse in the workplace. So, you know, we, like I said, we might be thinking about agricultural workers, we might be thinking about domestic workers, we might be thinking about people working in the hospitality industry. So, you know, one of the things that we are keeping close track of is what the industries are, um, what industries people are in that are bringing us 
their stories, either by, you know, bringing their complaints to us or um, having attorneys apply to us for funding. And that is what this chart shows. Now I'm looking at it. Okay, good. The chart has words. You can you can see what is um, what is represented in this. Um, and you know some of it um, is maybe unexpected to some folks. We've had we've had quite a lot of complaints come to us about the federal government. Um, we've had uh, federal government and you know nonprofit and state government. Um, I think this is you know an industry that it, it, or sectors that maybe people don't always think about. Um, I, you know, I think people when they think about Me Too, because it's been really associated with the entertainment industry, expect that we're going to be hearing about that. And certainly we have been getting complaints from people in that industry, but it's, it's you know, not exclusive to that. It's really all, all across the map, all industries. Um, these are really issues that are, um, are coming out in all, Industries and all all sectors of our population, um, and that is you know an, an exciting part of what we're doing here. What we're hoping to do is allow people to bring these stories out um, from you know all sort of all sectors of society, and also get the word out that people can speak out. Um, and you know one of the things that we are considering, and another one of our priority areas is cases that um, might make it so that people feel um, less reluctant to speak out. Um, so, you know, some of the kinds of cases that we're finding, for example, have to do with defending people who are getting accused of defamation or are having, um, you know, the employees that they're accusing bringing cases against them in retaliation. And, you know, that might be a more non-traditional thing to imagine funding because we're not, you know, funding them to bring an affirmative lawsuit. Um, but but the thinking there is that by doing that, we will be chipping away at some of the some of the many barriers that might make people feel afraid or reluctant to come forward with their stories. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm not sure what you're showing me here. Okay, I'm going to read that to later. Okay, sorry, there was showing me questions that are coming up here, and thank you, folks, for submitting questions. I'm going to hold the questions until the end, um, so that I make sure to get through all this information, and then we'll we'll try to leave a lot of time for questions at the end. Um, huh? This is not the slide I was expecting to see. Maybe I'm in a different order. Okay. Um, all right. Sorry, I was having a little confusion about the slides, but um, this was meant to explain that we are having people come to us not only with stories about sexual harassment, sexual abuse, hostile work environment, but also retaliation. Um, you know, that is a separate legal claim, but we have been hearing that in so so very many of the stories that people are bringing to us. Um, and that retaliation takes different forms. It, you know, it might be people coming forward and saying that um, their shifts have been cut, there's no more work, they're pushed off important projects, um, or that they're fired outright. And those are all um, definitely stories that we have been having people bring forward to us. Um, you know, <clears throat> I've been saying over and over again that we are thinking about low-wage workers. I think that dovetails so well with the, the previous presenters uh, comments about you know the the hardships and the barriers that that might be faced by domestic workers, um, and you know one of the things that we are really focusing on here is that low wage workers are particularly likely to face sexual harassment, are particularly particularly vulnerable um, to those kinds of things. Um, domestic workers and hotel workers are working in isolated conditions that makes it um, easier for this kind of thing to happen um, without other people, without there being witnesses, um, without there being um, a clear way for them to speak out. Um, restaurant workers are often earning less than minimum wage and relying on customers' tips. So, you know, you have a restaurant worker and they are relying on those tips to make a living wage, to be able to, you know, pay their rent, um, take care of their families, get by. And that makes it a lot more difficult for that person to 
want to speak out if they have a customer who's always coming in and harassing them. Um, you know, if, if there's a there's a pressure there to accept what's happening so that they can get the tip um, and and not lose their job. So those are all um, certainly pressures that that we are cognizant of and and hearing the stories of folks that are that are coming to us. We go on. Um, retaliation um, is even more pronounced for low wage workers than people in other kinds of industries um, for you know for these similar kinds of reasons. These are folks that um, they can't afford to lose their jobs or their paychecks. Uh, they are easily fired and replaced. And for domestic workers, being fired can also mean losing losing their housing as well. Um, I, I was thinking about a, a case that we recently decided to fund. We had an attorney come to us and bring us um, an application for funding for a case for a woman who had been working as a, a personal care assistant, personal care assistant, she described it as, um, for an older man who had Parkinson's. And, you know, that sort of sounds like perhaps he, um, you know, needed help and, and would be in himself in a weakened position. Um, but as almost as soon as she began working for this man, he was subjecting her to sexual harassment all of all almost all the time. He would leave his computer open so that she would see pornographic pictures, um, talk to her about her body and about naked women, uh, try to brush up against her breasts and her legs when she was, you know, helping him with the things that she was doing, um, asking her to massage him. And this was a woman who had a very low wage, uh, was a woman of mixed race, and I say that because it brings in the intersectionality issues, was a, a single mother, and the person that she was working for was, um, you know, an older gentleman with Parkinson's, but uh, still working on some high-level business matters that he had been involved in as a, as a high-level executive before. So she felt all of these different pressures to not be able to speak out because she was relying on him for the job. Um, she thought that he was going to be able to wield his power and influence to help her get into a better situation. Um, and, you know, this is a woman who then felt pressured to endure this very um, ongoing, physical, degrading conduct on a daily basis in, in her job. Um, can we go on to the next slide? Um, well, I, I was just giving an example of, of a case that we had funded, and this is a quote. You know, one of um, one of the things that has been rewarding so far is that we hear from people who have been able to get attorneys, and also from attorneys about the difference that the funding and the access to funding makes for them. Um, this is a, a quote from a person who was saying this to us that um, the client is a low wage retail worker who didn't have the funds to hire an attorney. She was in a small firm that wasn't able to take cases, cases pro bono. The legal defense fund connected her to the client um, and now she and her client are feeling so supportive. So, you know, we are in a, we are in a time where we are all in this fight together and hearing this really difficult news all of the time. So when we have, um, folks come to us and tell us about the difference that the funding makes. It is definitely the kind of thing that we all email it to one another and feel warmed by that. Um, so we applaud those as, as little victories along the way. Um, people here recommended that I tell you all about um, what action items you can take, what kinds of things you can do to support the work that we are doing with the Times Up Legal Defense Fund. Um, read about us online. Um, we um, are always looking for attorneys to join our legal network. That is a big ask that I would put out there. Um, if you're interested, there's a lot of information about it on the website. Um, tell people about the legal network for gender equity. Um, we are you know, accepting intakes, accepting complaints from all manner of people. I think I have ended up talking about low-wage workers and domestic workers, but we are taking complaints from people about sexual harassment and sexual abuse in the workplace and also in healthcare and educational settings. Um, and it, it's helpful to us to have folks get the word out. So, 
So I think with that, I will turn it to questions. Okay. Yes, thank you um, so much for that great presentation. I'm going to look, this is Kelly. I'm going to look to Sarah to see to offer our first question. Yeah, so uh, the first one is a quick uh, clarification question um, asked uh, about the earlier slide and, uh, where you, um, Jennifer, where you discussed the different industries. Um, mm -hmm. One of them was identified as other, uh, and uh, uh, the question after was just wondering on um, what kind of industries are located um, or included in that section. So I'm just going to go back to that slide really quickly. Everyone else's reference what we're answering. So here you see the other. Yes, I don't have a clear answer to this one. I think you know other here really means um, all of the other teams that we've got listed fit neatly into one of the categories that is represented in that pie chart. But um, you know, if folks really are interested in a more detailed list of all of the industries that we've got complaints from, that is something that I could send to folks after after today. Um, well, um, I was going to ask one question that we that I will it came to me while we were while both of you were talking. So I'm going to ask um, to both of you what this, we've been hearing this a lot in the news about people not coming forward. Um, could you both talk a little bit about what are the reasons why women don't? come forward and don't report sexual harassment or assault, particularly when we're talking about in the workplace. Sure. Um, I, I will go first because I am <laughs> looking at Kelly answering the question and it's making me want to go first. Um, there are so many reasons that women might not come forward. I mean, ah, goodness, like just, just the news in, um, you know, all over the place this week, I think it makes us think about some of the reasons that people might not want to come forward. One of them is, you know, power dynamics. A lot of folks that are coming to us are just intimidated about the money and power of the person who is harassing them. Um, I think another reason is just financial vulnerability. People depend on their jobs for sustenance to be able to keep paying their bills, to be able to provide for their families, um, and they don't want to get involved in, in rocking the boat in that way. I think sometimes people don't know uh, who to report to or how to report. Um, that is one of the things that I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, this project and, and, you know, all of the attention to the Me Too movement over the past year may help to do is just demystify the process a little bit and have people um, have some information about where they might be able to turn um, if they do want to speak out. Um, I think sometimes people don't um, don't know that they that they have these kinds of rights. Maybe they haven't um, even become aware that what what they are experiencing is something that they could speak out about. You know, some of the cases that we hear about do involve certainly a rape or a forcible assault or, you know, something that's a clear, really awful incident. But some of them are more things that are happening in, you know, sort of a little drip of harassment, little by little, over a long period of time. And I think, you know, that makes it that makes it a tougher case. Um, but that also makes it so that it is more difficult for folks to to think of it as something that they can speak out about and maybe to get um, motivated and get the courage to do something about it. Um, because you get sort of used to it and you've got to deal with all of the other things that are going on. You know, I think that's part of the reason that we um, want to think about helping low-wage workers and undocumented folks and people that are dealing with all kinds of intersecting um, issues is because if you are, you know, dealing with um, all these other challenges, it may be that you just don't decide to speak out about the, you know, the everyday 
terrible problems that you are facing at your workplace. Um, and go ahead. Jess, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, add to that, particularly thinking about uh, your members and what things that might be barriers for them being able to come forward. And also, yeah. what we yeah. go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. And also, right, and also if you have thoughts for what um, those of us sitting listening to the webinar can do to make it easier and to try to pave the way to make it um, easier for people to be able to report. Yeah, completely. Um, so. I mean, one of the biggest barriers is that, um, you know, domestic workers are often extremely um, low paid um, and the job that they and the and the reason that they're doing the job is because um, they really desperately need the work. So one for many of them, when they're weighing whether or not they should come forward about harassment or assault or violence, um, they're they're actually legitimately like weighing whether or not it, it's worth losing their job, whether they can afford it. So you know that's just a a, com a completely um, difficult choice that nobody should ever have to make. And then say it's one of the biggest barriers that they have. It's like you know many of them have families, and it's a question of whether or not they can put dinner on the table for their kids, or whether they can come forward about. Um, you know, any abuse that they suffered. And the other thing I would just add is like, you know, it's, it is very unique um, to have the workplace be a home where you're in a one-to-one -one usually relationship with your employer. If those employers are also the people who are perpetuating the violence, it is extremely unclear who they should go to. So one thing that, you know, we really need to make sure of is that um, two things. One, that domestic workers um, have contracts. Uh, it's it's really important to have a contract with domestic worker and to encourage people to have contracts with domestic workers. If you're a domestic employer, you can in, you can join our domestic employer network um, by going to domesticemployers.org. And there's actually a checklist that we have developed to help you figure out um, whether or not you are treating your domestic workers with dignity and respect. And then I think the other piece is if you're not a domestic employer, um, but you um, know people who employ domestic workers, or maybe even you, you know, occasionally bring someone into your home to um, take care of your children, take care of your, um, uh, you know, elderly relatives, um, clean the house before a big event. It's really, really important um, to understand uh, how to be as respectful and flexible as possible. Um, and, and then, you know, I think the other piece is like, it's incredibly important for all of us to do whatever we can to make sure that domestic workers know their rights. Many of them do not um, understand that they have rights because um, there are so many that domestic workers are excluded from. So this is like a, a really critical piece of the work that we're trying to do is helping people understand, even if they're undocumented, even if their work is often invisible, even if they don't get paid very much, they still have rights. Thank you. Can I ask um, one follow-up question to that, you, if you might not be a, someone who directly employs, if you're not someone who directly employs domestic workers, but maybe works through a service, occasionally hires a service, are there things that you should be asking that service about to make sure that they are protecting their employees? Yeah. Um, one is whether or not um, domestic workers get to set their rates. We're seeing really alarming changes um, where domestic workers who traditionally have been independent contractors and thus um, uh, have the benefit of being able to set their rates as independent contractors, but also um, like all independent contractors don't have the benefit of being um, considered employees. We're seeing that with many of the apps, maybe you're um, going to an app or a website, um, or an agency that they're not able to set their rates. So it's really important for a domestic worker to get a living wage. And I'll just say out loud that um, if you know our guidance around um, a, a living wage for a domestic worker depends on um, you know every locality and the cost of living there, but at a minimum um, they should be making $15 an hour if they're with an agency and $25 an hour if they are um, an independent. Domestic workers often travel long distances to get to their jobs. And, um, you know, depending on how large, let's say if you're a house cleaner, depending on how large a house is, um, you may not be able to 
a complete very many houses in a day. So $25 an hour might feel like a lot to you, um, but actually if you could only clean two houses and each of them take four hours, it's really not a lot of money for a domestic worker. Um, and when you consider that she's also an independent contractor who pays taxes um, on uh, those wages, it can be really, really difficult for them to make ends meet. So that's one of the first ones. The second one is asking about things like breaks. Um, many domestic workers uh, do not receive any breaks uh, for the bathroom or to t or to get water. Um, we're really talking about very basic rights that uh, uh, many domestic workers are fighting for, so that's really, really critically important. And if a domestic worker um, that you know lives in a home, um, it's really critical that they receive time off um, and that also they receive their wages in a timely manner. We have, I have like so many horror stories about workers who um, haven't been paid in months or even years of time. Thank you. Um, our next question, uh, I believe, is directed at Jennifer. Stephanie Delgado asks, um, since the majority of women are white, uh, what efforts are made to make Time's Up Legal Defense Fund more accessible to women of color who are disproportionately affected by workplace harassment? It's a terrific question. I think what you mean is that most of the women that we have been serving so far are white. That's what our pie chart that I showed during the slide shows. Um, and this is a big issue. I mean, you know, certainly we do. Uh, we do want to be helping white survivors of sexual harassment and abuse also. But yes, we look at that chart and think we've got some work to do. And there are different things that we are doing to try to make sure that we are reaching survivors of color. One of the things that we're doing that I am personally really excited about is, and that I didn't touch on in my presentation, I realize, is that we are also allotting some of the funding, the Times Up funding that we have, to outreach grants. And what I mean by that is we had a competitive grant application process where advocacy organizations could come to us and apply for funding to do outreach to workers about their rights and remedies available to survivors of sexual harassment and abuse. We've just announced the, the first class of outreach grantees, and you can see information about those grantees on our website. And it's a really fantastic set of organizations that represent, um, you know, all different parts of the country. And, you know, we were very thoughtful about trying to choose groups that would be able to get to survivors of color, low-wage workers, people um, working in different industries, undocumented folks. And that, uh, you know, and part of that is because we do want to make sure that, um, you know, people sort of across all sectors of our society are are finding out about our projects and learning about their rights and remedies and getting access to um, to the kinds of help that we are offering. So terrific question, um, but you know uh, we don't leave it at that. I think another thing that we try to do is to um, you know partner and consult with all of our allies, the different organizations. You know, a, a, a beautiful thing about having the the Times of Legal Defense Fund house that and administered by the National Women's Law Center is that we have this group here of, um, you know, sort of fierce and brilliant women's rights activists working on all different kinds of issues. And they have, um, you know, deep ties to advocacy organizations um, that work with communities of color on, on their respective issues. And, you know, we are um, working in partnership with all of those folks too and trying to make sure that we are bringing an intersectional approach to our work and that we are um, getting input from our sister organizations about how we can do our work in a in a more intersectional way and how we can reach out to the communities that they serve um so thank you an, an important question and you know by no means can i say that our, our work is is done on that front we we do intend to um keep thinking about that you know in an ongoing way. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we are about out time. I really appreciate both of you for taking the time to speak with us today. This was a wonderful webinar and I learned a lot listening to it. I don't know, Sarah, if there are any um, technical things before we sign off? No, that's it. Just uh, make sure to, to look out over the next week uh, in your inboxes for a follow-up email with 
from us, including a link to this recording um, and to the uh, PDF of the PowerPoint. That way you can see um, <laughs> what the, the graphs look like without the, the strange, um, strange things on them. So they'll be correct in the, the one that we post online. Um, thank you so much for attending today, everyone, and have a, have a good afternoon or evening.